Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the EduTech Digital Summit 2020. Today, we have a very exciting interview with Mr. Eric Mazur, who is the Professor of Physics and of Applied Physics at Harvard University, USA. Eric will be interviewed by Mr. Cameron Mirza, who is the Chief of Party at IREX in Jordan. We're very excited to have you both here, and thank you both for your time. Without further ado, Cameron, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Ria. Professor Eric Mazur, uh, Professor of Applied Physics at Harvard University, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to EduTech 2020. The pleasure. Delight <laughs> well, we, I think, I think it's hard, it's, it, there's so many different possibilities in terms of, in, in terms of where we start our, our discussion today. I think if I just take a few seconds just to reflect on, on, the, on, on the pressures that global education has faced over the last six months with the global pandemic. Um, we've, seen, we've seen universities now go back or try to go back for, for the new semester. We've seen outbreaks of COVID breaking out in campuses all over the, all over the world. We've seen, uh, the, we've seen the results of a global survey, the Global Learner Survey 2020, which, which does uh, point at young people and students being somewhat dissatisfied with what they've received in terms of teaching and learning over the, over the course of the last six months. It, it's really, it's really, and, and, and add to the fact that 90% of students around the world have had to, have had to for, forego face-to-face -face instruction for new types of modality, whether that be internet, TV, radio in some countries. What's your perspective on, on, on the last six months from your vantage point of, you know, uh, uh, of, of being somebody who's really at the cutting edge of education? That's a very good question, Cameron. And I, I have gone through these past six months with a mix of feeling, feelings. First of all, you know, I teach at Harvard a course that is team-based, that is project-based, where students work on projects, building things. So my first gut reaction when we were chased off campus in early March and, uh, and had to take our courses online was one of uh, panic, you know, how am I going to overcome this challenge? But very quickly, I started to see it not as a challenge, but an opportunity. But I think if you take on the, 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 this is a tremendous challenge mindset, let's go back to what we did before as quickly as possible. Um, I think you miss a huge opportunity. Think about education in general. Education has evolved very little in a thousand years compared to all other human endeavors. And essentially in most places of higher education, but also K through 12, the way we teach is still basically the same as it was before Gutenberg, so to speak, was people lecturing, transferring information, thinking that learning is the same thing as teaching. What the, the pandemic has done in a sense is, you know, been a, a huge wake up call for all of education saying, hey, is what we're doing in the classroom really the best approach? Are there opportunities that we should be exploring? And I think the pandemic has shown that, A, we should shift away from teaching by telling, and B, we should completely rethink our, our assessment because most traditional assessment falls brutally apart uh, if you take it into a, a remote scenario. So in a sense, I see this as an opportunity, not as a challenge. And my feeling is that education will have, in a sense, been fast forward to the future. In a, things will never go back exactly to the way they were before. I mean, that's, that's fascinating. And I mean, you, you draw, you draw um, some interesting conclusions that absolutely education has changed very little over, over the last 40, 50 years. And essentially a classroom today looks very similar to the classroom from the 60s or 70s. And yet, if I point to one of your contemporaries, uh, Professor Scott Galloway at NYU, the price point of education has risen, risen exponentially over the last, last 30, 40 years, which does bring a, a, you know, a legitimate question in terms of are young people getting 
you know, the experience that they that they're paying for, um, it, it, you know, at this point of time, which you know, which and I'd I'd love to get your view on uh, on on the quality, the cost versus quality uh, debate of higher education in particular. So just just drawing on your on your on your experiences, what, what's your take on this? Well, I, I wrote a, a, an article, an op-ed article with Senator Bob Carey in the Wall Street Journal a couple of months ago, addressing precisely this. Right. You're totally right. The, the, the cost has been rising exponentially. Yeah. However, the quality has, has not grown by, by the same amount. So in a certain sense, this, 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 is a, this is a good opportunity to reflect on that. Why has the cost increased? Why has the quality not increased in tandem with, uh, with the cost? And I think in part it's because we've never really had this incredible shakeup of the educational system that, we, that we're currently seeing, which is long overdue, long overdue. Because essentially our, most of our educational practices, and I'm gonna be exaggerating a little bit and be really harsh here, are still hmm. steeped in medieval tradi traditions. Essentially, you know, most of teaching is still in the form of a lecture as if lectures correspond to learning and as if we don't have any new ways of transferring information. We have plenty of new ways of, of transferring information that, uh, that, that, you know, research has shown work just as well, if not better than just passively sitting in a, uh, in a lecture. So I think this is the coronavirus moment for education. Right. I mean, I, I mean, I think it's it's a it's a it's a just time to use it and frame it in that way in terms of um, a watershed moment. If we look at all available evidence, if we look at the skills gap surveys out there, if we think about um, you know uh, you know the, the issues with employers. Um, uh, and um, and what higher education is is producing in terms of outcomes, it's clearly a big disconnect. Um, and if we bring if we bring it back to you know reinventing and reimagining the future of higher education or of education full stop, maybe it's worth us reflecting on on the critical role of a teacher in in all of this. Now we've got obviously teachers tuning in today from all across the region. And, and, and what, what it's probably fair to say is that teachers have been almost like first responders over the last few months. They're having to, um, you know, be, not just be committed to the cause, but also be quite innovative in terms of how they're able to teach. But being somebody who's a, who's a, who's a future thinker, what is the future of, of, of teaching? What does it look like and where do we need to go uh, to, to help it evolve? I think for, for way too long in education at all levels, you know, from, from elementary education to secondary to post-secondary, we have seen the teacher or the role of the teacher has been that of the sage on the stage, the person who, who delivers often through, you know, lecturing, uh, right. the knowledge that is then transferred to, to the students, which misses the whole point of how knowledge is uh, developed. Um, and I think one of the things that is, and think about other things you learn in life from playing an instrument to, to any of your hobbies like photography and so on, you wouldn't just you know, turn on the TV watching a pianist play the piano in order to learn how to play the piano. No, you have to do it yourself. And your music teacher is more like a coach than a performer. Likewise for anything else, you, you want to train for a marathon, you don't just watch people run marathons in order to become a better marathon runner. And, and, and your coach is a coach, it's just that, somebody who tells you how to improve your running skills, not somebody who is going to run for you. However, in most classrooms, it is the teacher teaching by example, rather than having the students um, do it. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I think there is a lot of truth in this overall uh, model, and I think that one of the things that is happening, and that has been precipitated by the move to remote teaching, is that the role of the teacher is shifting from sage on the stage to guide on the side, to a coach, somebody who who inspires and guides the students rather than 
just trans trying to transfer knowledge through telling. And I think that there are two other important shifts that are taking place. Education has very much in the past tended to be a synchronous, um, a synchronous happening, something that is synchronous between the teacher and the instructor, and where the pace has been set by the teacher, not by the learner. Now we all know that learning is not something that takes place at a set page. If you take a hundred individuals, some may at some points go faster than others and at other points it might be reversed. It's something that is not at all, uh, not at all sort of all at the same rate and all at the same pace. Yet we treat education as if it's a conveyor belt where all of the students go on this conveyor belt and what is done to them occurs at the same pace and at the same time for, for, for all of them. So I think one of the things we're discovering as we're moving online is that a lot of things which have for many, many centuries been synchronous activities could just as well be asynchronous activities. So they take place not when it is convenient for the teacher or when it happens to be convenient for the classroom scheduling, but when it is convenient for the learner, when the learner is most receptive for uh, that activity. And also not necessarily at a pace that is dictated by the instructor, but one that is controlled or left to the student. That doesn't mean that the instructor plays no role. No, on the contrary, the instructor has to play a huge role, namely one of trying to keep the students engaged in these uh, in these activities. So, that, that, I mean, that's that's fascinating insight because we're moving. Um, you absolutely, I think you're right. Moving towards more personalized, self-paced learning, but that also requires um, a couple of things, which I'd like to kind of gain your view on. As founder of, of uh, peer instruction. The emphasis has to shift and, uh, you know, have a greater focus on, on things like instructional design, learning design, which we haven't really heard a lot about. We simply because of the fact that I think we've been lulled into this uh, false sense of understanding that using Zoom or Teams is, in fact, technology, when in fact it's very basic. So I wanted to canvas your views on a the shift in in, in terms of pedagogy. In terms, of in, in terms of instructional design? And secondly, how can technology really enable uh, this kind of move towards self-paced uh, and the balance between synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities for, for students? So, so it's, in a sense, this is a double question. I'm gonna take the first parts uh, first. And I think I could not agree more with what you just said. This is such an important point. There is a huge gap between the learning sciences and the way learning is taking place or maybe teaching is taking place around, uh, around the world. And I think we need to close this gap. We need to find the best way. We need to adjust the way students learn to what we know from the learning sciences about how people learn. And unfortunately, many people who are doing the teaching are never trained in teaching. They might be trained in their discipline, but they're unaware of what is known in co from cognitive psychology and, 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 and other uh, aspects of neurobiology of how learning actually works and, and adjusting the teaching to what is known from the learning sciences is crucially important. And I think I'm just starting to see a slight mo movement in that direction, which is precipitated by um, the, the condition that we, we find ourselves under right now. Because I mean, a lot of people are discovering that if they simply lecture on Zoom the way they've always done, several things happen. First of all, because of people who deal with students in different time zones, the temptation to record and, and make the recording available for students, or even if you don't have the time zone differences, you know, why not hit that record button? And what you find is that many students will prefer watching the recording played back at two times its original speed rather than looking at the live lecture. And now all of a sudden, something that was passive not only remains passive, 
but also becomes a completely isolated um, activity. It's the student watching not the live lecture together with other students, but watching the recorded lecture alone, completely cut off from both the teacher as well as other students. Whereas deep down, learning is a social experience. It's something you do together. You need to interact with other human beings in order to do that. So I think people who have been lecturing via Zoom have been discovering that that takes something that already is not optimal and makes that even worse. That's why I say this is a great opportunity to rethink our approach to teaching and a, a great opportunity for people to find out that lecturing is not the best approach to teaching. Now, what is the role of technology there? My motto throughout my, my career and throughout the 30 years that I've been actively engaged in trying to improve education has always been pedagogy first, technology thereafter. In other words, think about pedagogy and then think about what technology should do in order to facilitate that pedagogy. Now, with the current crisis, we did not have that luxury. We were thrown into a, a situation that was completely different. And it so happened to be that Zoom was positioned right at the right place at the right time. And that people could use Zoom to lecture online. But there are so many other things you could do using Zoom or other platforms. So my advice to anybody in any situation, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, would be think about pedagogy first. Think about the outcomes first. What is it that you want your students to accomplish after your course or your lesson is over? And after you formulated that outcome, work back. What is the best way to accomplish that outcome? How can I maximize the outcome? And then think about you know, what you're going to do and what technology you're going to use. Unfortunately, a lot of that planning process for most people is inverse, is let's teach and let's see whatever tool we use to teach and then let's assess and see what comes out. It would be much better to think about the output first and then about the input. I mean, that's fascinating because it, it, it leads me to uh, my next point, which is about this, this sh fundamental shift work that we're talking about also, also requires a shift in both culture and leadership within institutions. Now, now we've obviously got education leaders as part of, as part of this, this, this conference here. What would your advice be to those education leaders who are perhaps struggling or grappling with this, with the pace of change and, and, and the shift in terms of the teaching and learning environment, what would, you, what would be your advice to, to, to those leaders? A couple of advice, um, advices. So the first one is to recognize that education has changed very, very little since the founding of the first universities in, uh, in uh, you know, before the Renaissance in, in Italy. We're still essentially following a model that, that, that predates any type of information technology. And I, I, I include the book in, uh, in information technology here. And the next thing is to ask, why has it not changed? And I think one of the reasons, you know, to critically ask ourselves, why has education changed so little where society and technology and everything else and science has changed dramatically and in an almost exponential fashion? And I think the reason is that, you know, we all tend to, to essentially project our own experiences. We're products of that approach to education. We become successful in our own disciplines. We become successful in our own institutions. We attribute our success to the way we were educated. 
not realizing that most of the students, 99.9% .9 of our students will not go on to the same type of you know, career path that we follow. They will go out into society and do very different things, become politicians, doctors, uh, workers, whatever. Uh, they will not become teachers. And we fail to recognize that we achieved what we achieved, not because of the way we were educated, but in spite of it mostly because we were very strongly intrinsically motivated, which might not be true for our students who are taking our course, following our lesson, not because they want to learn, but because somebody tells them they have to learn. So I think recognizing that there, it's a trap in a sense when you project your own experiences onto, uh, onto the world around you in this respect, and, and, and that we have to break that vicious cycle of thinking, we learned it this way, my students are going to be like me, and therefore I have to teach this way. And okay. instead to look for actual evidence. I mean, mm -hmm. think about it. Students graduate from my institutions, whether it's secondary education institutions or post-secondary, with a transcript and grades. How many employers are hiring simply based on the assessment that we provide? Zero. Every employer will actually interview because they know that there's very limited value in the grades and the assessment we give to our students. And we can make a long list of people who have been extremely successful in society, but flunked out of high school and out of higher education. Again, giving a clear message that our assessment of individuals in education has very limited value. So I would, I would ask people to reflect critically on these two statements and see that there is a need for change, that you know, there was a need to change already a long time ago, but it's particularly urgent right now. So no, no, that's, that's fascinating because it, it, it kind of uh, leads me to my next point, which is about assessment. It, 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 it seems to me in this day and age nonsensical for young people to be examined uh, by the traditional ways of memorising information and then pass, uh, doing, an, doing the exam based on memorisation uh, and, and then expected them to go on to, um, to really become kind of um, creators of knowledge and, 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 uh, and um, productive, productive people in the economy. So... If I think about the region where we are today in the Middle East and North Africa, the results of international assessments at, at, at school level, the PISA scores, the TIM scores, all fall below OECD average. Now, a lot of that could be attributed to the, to the, um, to the, to the mode of assessment. What is the future of assessment for, for young people? Surely these high stake exams are detrimental to the development of young people. I, I'm smiling here because I couldn't agree more. In fact, I have a talk called Assessment, the Silent Killer of Learning. The title is provocative and it's meant to be provocative. I think, I think you're, you're so right. We need to think not only about our approach to teaching, we need to think even more urgently about our approaches to assessment. And again, this is something that has been precipitated by the remote uh, instruction. How do you assess students on the internet when they have access to information? I'd like to briefly reflect on, on, on a taxonomy developed by Benjamin Bloom in the, in the 1950s with you know, the different levels of thinking skills with the lowest level thinking skills at the bottom and the higher, and you alluded to that, and the higher order uh, thinking skills at the top. The lowest level uh, thinking skill is memorization, knowing facts. The one above it is understanding, knowing how facts are related. And then comes analysis and evaluation. And, and all the way at the top is that level that we really aspire to, creativity. Mm. Now, if you look at most assessment around the world, it's stuck at the bottom. Most of that, why? Because it's the easiest to assess, right? If, if you ask a question that is factual, it's either right or wrong. So you can easily 
attach a grade to it and give an evaluation. If you look at creativity all the way at the top, it is very, very difficult because people might not agree about what is creative and innovative. In fact, you know, the, create, the creative aspect might only be seen years later after the innovator or the creator is, might, not even, might not even be alive anymore. So one of the things that is happening as we're moving in a, in, into a remote scenario is that um, we are discovering that we can no longer assess for the lowest order thinking skill memorization. Because let's say I ask you a fact-based question, uh, you know, you could just type, go to your browser and type the fact-based question in Google and there it is. You know what? I think that is actually the biggest benefit to education that there has been in a long, long time that we discover that having access to browsers during assessment is actually a good thing because it no longer is about memorizing facts. It's about, first of all, judging the validity of facts you find on the internet, but more importantly, using fact-based knowledge to, to develop higher order thinking skills. So I think that one of the positive side effects of what we're going through now is hopefully that the assessment will move away from the lowest order thinking skill and be forced up Bloom's taxonomy. To me, any question to which the answer can be Googled is not a valid assessment question. And if you look at most assessment, I mean, critically, if you look, if you take any exam that's being given and you copy the questions and paste them in Google, you will find that 99% of the answers to the questions can be found in Google. That's, that's a great, not acceptable. Uh, no, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that uh, you made some great points there. I think, you know, in the last few minutes, I'd like to get your um, reflections on a few things. There are, there are, there are, there's a school of thought, um, uh, out there that says that online learning doesn't solve the challenges of cost, access, and quality. And in fact, uh, we've seen uh, we've seen uh, young people with poor access to um, infrastructure, to Wi-Fi, um, uh, struggle with online learning. In fact, the the, the the question of equity comes up, and in fact, the the gaps are getting bigger, not smaller. What what's your take on this? I, I, I think we're all struggling, all in our own ways. And I think that this period of, of adapting and change brings with it difficulties for many people. And yes, maybe that, that it exacerbated some digital divides, but at the same time, at the same time, it is a potential equalizer on the longer term because what can happen is that it unleashes innovations in parts of society that has been disadvantaged in the past. Will it be the panacea for everybody? No, of course not. Will it create difficulties? Yes, for everybody. But already, I mean, in my travels to Africa, for example, I've seen how, I mean, I'm gonna use an example that's not directly related to education, but, but it serves to illustrate a purpose. In countries like Tanzania and others, they're using, I forgot the name, but they're using a uh, financial platform that has a mobile platform for withdrawing money and making payments that has completely revolutionized the way transactions and business is done in, in, in those countries. Something that would have been inimaginable with banks the way they are in most of the developed uh, world. And I predict that similar things will happen in education where suddenly somebody thinks of a of a way of delivering quality education to people who are, who are, you know, or have been disadvantaged for a very long time. So yes, there are growing pains, no question about it. And it will exacerbate inequalities that, and inequities that, that may already have been because education is incredibly inequitable and uh, around the world already. But at the same time, I think it offers an opportunity for people who have been disadvantaged to leapfrog ahead in a way that would not otherwise have been possible.
I mean, that, that's fascinating, and it and it all and it kind of ties into my perhaps my final question uh, around um, entrepreneurship in in education. Now, you you've been somebody you you are somebody who's been the founder of several startups, and the Middle East region is pushing big on on the entrepreneurship agenda now. Um, you're very fortunate to work for a, for a university that has founded some of the biggest and greatest companies in the world. Your alumni. What is your advice when you reflect on, on, on your experiences and the work of Harvard? What are, the, what are the two or three bits of advice that you could pass down to universities in the MENA region who are really at this point of time struggling somewhat with, in, with infusing the entrepreneurial mindset and, and um, abilities within their students? I think in the sense this ties us back to the very first question you you asked and, 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 and where the discussion was headed right at the beginning, namely the best way to handle the current situation is to see it not as a challenge, but an opportunity. First of all, an opportunity to transform education. Secondly, an opportunity to innovate. And thirdly, an opportunity for entrepreneurs to fill a gap between the traditional approach to education and, and one, you know, maybe that will form or, or shape education in the future. So I, I, I see all those three things very closely tied together. And, uh, and, and that's what makes me so incredibly convinced that we're headed in, a, in, a, in the right direction and that this is such an incredibly exciting time to be living in and to be an educator in. So, that, I mean, we're, we're almost out of time and, and we, we could go on, um, you know, talking, uh, you know, having this, you know, great intellectual discussion on, but in terms of the future education and, and, and the, the pace of which technology is moving, uh, and, and, and yet we've seen huge movement in, in a relatively small, uh, short space of time within education systems. Un, un, uh, really un, uh, unbelievable um, shift. Where, what will we be talking about in five years time? What will education look and feel like in five years time? Will we go back to the way it was? Or do you really think that in five years time, education would have moved on and the issues uh, would be very different to, to what they are today. Well, look, <clears throat> given how little education has evolved over a thousand years, I'm sure that there will, be con there will still be sectors of education that will continue to hang on to, to, to traditions. Um, at the same time, however, I know that, and, and I have been an innovator in education for a long time, I know that the current crisis has forced me to make changes that I had would never have thought about or would have undertaken had this crisis not happened. And I know that there are certain aspects of my course which will never go back. Even if tomorrow, all of a sudden, the pandemic were to mysteriously disappear overnight and we were told you can come back to campus, I know that I would continue to do certain things that I'm doing now in a remote scenario because I know they work better and, and they work better because they match better how people learn. So, so I don't know how education is going to evolve. I'm, I'm not a, a fortune teller, unfortunately, and it's hard to see in the, in the future, but I, I, I am convinced that many things will have changed and it will have become institutionalized by the time the pandemic is over and it will be for the better. Well, I mean, on that, on that final, um, on that sense of optimism, which I share with you, uh, it only uh, remains for me to uh, thank you, Professor Eric Mazur, for such an enlightening and thought-provoking um, interview and discussion about, about education and the future of education. And uh, I really appreciate your time. It's been a, it's been a delightful experience. And I'll, I'll, I'll hand back now to our organizers. Thank, Thank you. you. It, was, it was my pleasure, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Eric and Cameron, for your time um, this afternoon. What an interesting and insightful session. We were thrilled to have you both on board. And um, 
we look forward uh, to working with you both again. Fantastic having you on behalf of the whole team. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Thank you.